The Qin dream of empire was complete. China was unified and at peace. Now a true emperor, Ying Zhang needed a royal name. He would come to be known throughout China and around the world simply as Shi Wang Di, the first emperor. Shi Wang Di proclaimed his dynasty would last 10,000 generations. It was during his reign that China embarked on perhaps the most spectacular construction project of all time, a wall unlike any the world had ever seen. But the Qin would pay a heavy price for their emperor's grand ambitions in the wrath of ruthless leaders and the blood of its own people. The Chinese invented deep drilling in the first century BC and were able to drill boreholes up to 4,800 feet deep. 220 BC, China's first emperor, the triumphant Shi Huangdi, sets off to survey his new empire. For the first time ever, China was unified and secure, and he intended to keep it that way with the most ambitious engineering project ever conceived the Great Wall of China. Well, the Great Wall was a linking up of walls that had existed previously. A number of states in the north of China had built walls partly to defend against one another, but more importantly, to defend their northern frontier. It remains to this day unsurpassed by modern engineering, a single impregnable barrier to seal the vast Chinese empire from the outside world, along a border that stretches for thousands of miles. This is Chongchong. In Mandarin, it means long wall. And believe me, covering more turf than the continental United States is wide, and including all of its spurs that go off into no place, it's 6,000 miles. And man, that's long. Shi Huangdi, China's first emperor, started building it 2,000 years ago. It was worked on right up until the 17th century, but the original wall didn't look like this. It was kind of a mud brick affair, but it presented an interesting engineering challenge nonetheless, because it had to go all the way from the sea in the east to the Gobi Desert in the west, just to keep the northern nomads like the Mongols out and the Chinese people in. If it took the audacity of emperors to dream great, it took the relentless drive of the Chinese labor force to build great, but not without a price. Their capacity to endure hardship was unimaginable. Men, women, and children worked with their hands on this wall, and if you complained or tried to run away, you were killed. Disease was constant, injury was commonplace. Dressed only in rags, these people suffered bitter cold, bitter hunger, bitter exhaustion. Records say that at the height of production on this wall, close to one-fifth of China's entire labor force, one million people were working here, and a quarter of those people died. And if you died here, usually you were buried here, in the wall, giving rise to its other nickname among some, the Long Graveyard. Millions of arms and legs and backs were broken to build the wall. There is very moving poetry, mostly written by wives and mothers, about young boys going off and working on the Great Wall Project, not having food, dying in the uh, cold winters, and never returning home. But brute force would not be enough. Different regions had vastly different terrain and varying construction materials on hand. Wherever possible, engineers added to existing walls but most of it was built from scratch. They devised a brilliant system utilizing one material they had in abundance. The tamped earth method is what Chinese is called a hang tu. What this means is that you build a wooden frame to enclose the wall, and uh, you start low with, say, two boards parallel, and then you pour some gravel and some sticks and some clay, and then you use the end of a log to beat it and pound it until it's very, very compact. And then you put another layer in, and you keep doing that. And then you put other uh, boards on the outside to hold it in place. And you keep going up and keep going up until you reach the height that you want. When it was dry, the frame was removed, leaving just a solid slab of tamped earth, strengthened by the willow reeds, 
like the steel rebar that reinforces modern concrete. The southern side, facing China, was defended by a simple parapet, while the northern side, facing the barbarians, was crenellated. There was a guard tower every 700 to 1,000 yards. A paved road ran along the top of the wall for troops and even wagons, making it an efficient communications route, especially for the soldiers stationed at each tower. But as a work of military engineering, the wall was only partially successful. A wall exists to be defended, but in the long run, the wall was not very defensible. Nomads could break through it or go around it, bribe their way through it. But the Great Wall was not only designed to keep barbarians out, it was also a symbolic dividing line, locking the Chinese in. The Great Wall, in a sense, is a cultural marker as much as it is a military fortification. It's a way of the Chinese saying to the nomads, you stay out there and raise horses and sheep and we'll stay in here and grow grain. By 210 BC, the Great Wall had stretched over 3,000 miles, leaving an indelible mark on China's harsh terrain. But resentment was swelling into a rage against Shi Huangdi. Many in his kingdom felt the colossal barrier was not worth the toll it inflicted on the Chinese people. Once again, his enemies were plotting against him. Shi Huangdi's final years were marked by what I think is reasonable to call paranoia. But as the old joke says, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't out to get you. At least three assassination plots came very close to succeeding. Shi Huangdi struck back by turning China into a virtual prison for its people. He ordered all historical records of his ruthless regime destroyed. Punishment for anyone who didn't comply was forced labor or even death. Some 400 people were buried alive as a lesson to those who spoke out against the regime. When the emperor's eldest son objected, even he was banished. Shi Huangdi's brilliant vision had transformed China into a great empire, but he paid the price with a descent into madness. He would now turn his obsessions and his army of forced labor to another stunning feat of construction begun years earlier. A monument to his own fear and death. In the 1040s, movable type printing was invented in China, a huge development in the history of printing. By 220 BC, Qin Emperor Shi Huangdi has united China for the first time. On the northern border, millions are toiling and dying, laying the foundation for China's signature engineering triumph. The 3,000 mile long Great Wall. But the first emperor wasn't done. Even as he fought against other Chinese kingdoms and his own demons, Shi Huangdi began to garrison nearly 700,000 men near his capital in central China to build the most personal of all his engineering projects, an epic tomb he had begun planning at the age of 13. This was a monumental project that required the labor of thousands and thousands of people over a very long time. It was, by design, the biggest and best tomb that China had ever known. In 1974, Farmers digging a well came face to face with an ancient Chinese warrior. The mysterious terracotta skull would prove the gateway to one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. The mound is huge. The mound was always known to be the tomb mound of the first emperor. What was a total surprise was the uh, army of terracotta warriors about a kilometer to the east of the tomb who presumably were guarding the approach to the tomb itself.